I'm Dr. Keith Kowalczyk. I'm a urologic surgeon at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. I mainly focus in robotic surgery and urologic oncology, specializing in prostate cancer and kidney cancer. I'm a general urologist, so I'll see all sorts of urologic diseases, but I primarily focus on urologic oncology, which is kidney tumors, bladder tumors, prostate cancer, and things of that nature. I operate on these tumors if, they, if need be, or if there are other minimally invasive approaches, I also take a minimally invasive approach to most of these tumors. Urology is, in my opinion, better than any other surgical specialty because we are able to follow our patients for a long period of time, not just by operating on them, but treating them medically and, and following them for, for follow-up and whatnot. And I also enjoy the technology that urology provides. You know, we've really been on the cutting edge of first laparoscopic surgery and now robotic surgery. We were kind of the pioneers in these fields, so I really enjoyed being part of bringing robotic surgery to the forefront for some of these diseases. I love my job because I always wanted to be a surgeon, but I also wanted to treat cancer my whole life. And, and a big part of urology is, is oncology. Probably 60 to 70 percent of what we do is oncology. And I like being able to see patients and see them in a real time of need. You know, having a diagnosis of cancer is a very hard thing to take. And I like to walk them through that process as well as be able to treat them and hopefully give them good outcomes and follow them up for long periods of time. Robotic surgery is essentially an evolution of laparoscopic surgery. It's keyhole surgery in which a camera is used through small incisions to look through the abdominal cavity or the organ that of interest. Other small keyhole incisions are then made to insert instruments that we use to perform the operation. Under traditional laparoscopic surgery, we as the surgeons control the instruments with our own bare hands. With robotic surgery, there's a robotic console that comes over and actually handles the instruments while the surgeon is at a separate console and controls those instruments completely. Now the benefits of this is that the robotic instruments are much more precise than traditional laparoscopic instruments and also the interface of the robot eliminates any surgeon tremor so it makes it a much more precise surgery. Additionally the camera used for robotic surgery is much stronger than traditional laparoscopic surgery. It has a three-dimensional view so I'm able to see any of the organs of interest much much better uh, and it also has magnification of the surgical field up to 10 to 12 times magnification depending on the series of robot that you have. So all of this adds up to a much more precise, much more clean surgery in my opinion. I'm often asked by my patients whether I'm performing the surgery and the robot's performing the surgery and it's an important point to make that the robot's simply an extension of my hands to perform a better surgery for them. When I perform robotic surgery, I'm in complete control of the robot. The robot mimics my hands and I'm simply using the robot as another surgical tool to provide them a better surgery. It's also important for patients to realize that it isn't just the robot that makes a better surgery, but it's the experience and the training of a surgeon that makes a better surgery. Uh, patients with ele elevated PSA or prostate specific antigen who are worried that they have prostate cancer, anyone with a renal mass, patients with blood in their urine or who have a worry about bladder cancer, I would see all of those types of patients, evaluate them and figure out what kind of treatment is best for them. The most common robotic surgery that urologists perform is a radical prostatectomy. However, we've also kind of applied it to kidney surgeries as well, such as a partial nephrectomy, which is a removal of a kidney tumor, a pyeloplasty, which is a repair of, a, of an obstructed or blocked kidney. Uh, we've also applied these surgeries to uh, radical cystectomy, which is a removal of the entire bladder for bladder cancer, as well as other complex urologic reconstructive procedures. Anyone that's a candidate for surgery in general, which means that they are generally healthy, uh, have a greater than 10 year life expectancy, is a candidate for robotic surgery. In fact, I think more patients are candidates for robotic surgery than open surgery. Uh, for example, men with higher BMIs or heavier men. Traditionally, that was a very difficult procedure to do if you did it open because you just didn't have the visualization. With a robot, we're able to visualize the prostate much easier in these heavier men and in fact able to offer the sur surgery to men with higher body mass index. Um, there are, I'm, I'm often asked if patients with inguinal hernia repairs or umbilical hernia repairs are able to undergo the procedure and the answer is yes, they can still undergo the procedure as well.
Well, you get the overall benefits of traditional laparoscopic surgery, which includes lower blood loss, less pain, smaller incision, shorter hospital stay, earlier convalescence, or earlier return to work. Uh, but the added benefits are just because of the more precision that the robot allows us. Uh, the 3D magnification plus the, the 10 to 12 times magnification allows us to see the neurovascular bundle around the prostate, which is the, the nerves that supply erections, much, much better and theoretically lead, lead to better nerve sparing. Additionally, we're able to see the urethral sphincter that controls continence much better, and that can possibly lead to lower rates of incontinence. Uh, actually, in a study that we've we've performed recently, we've noted that there's lower perioperative complications, lower mortality, as well as uh, lower long-term complications in men undergoing robotic surgery versus open surgery. So there are multiple benefits to, to performing the robotic surgery over the open surgery. Generally, any prostate cancer treatment, you worry about long-term erectile dysfunction and urinary dysfunction, and that includes radiation treatments or surgical treatments. So robotic prostatectomy can lead to erectile dysfunction. However, in younger men who have good baseline erectile function are able to undergo a bilateral nerve sparing procedure, they can have very good outcomes and, and potentially regain uh, acceptable erections within one to two years after surgery, although some men may require pharmace uh, pharmaceuticals or, or some men may require medications to help them out. As far as urinary incontinence, total urinary incontinence is very, very rare after the procedure, but it can happen in less than 1% of patients. Uh, using the robot, we've actually noted an earlier return to urinary incontinence uh, than those undergoing the, the open procedure. Uh, this normally improves within the year, a year after surgery, especially with Kegel exercises and pelvic floor rehabilitation. Kidney surgeries can be very complex, especially if you're doing a partial nephrectomy or a pyeloplasty. A partial nephrectomy being removal of just a, a tumor and a pyeloplasty being reconstructed, uh, reconstructing a blocked kidney. Uh, after we do these procedures, it involves a lot of reconstruction of the kidney or suturing of the kidney. So that makes these very difficult procedures to perform laparoscopically. Uh, and often they were performed open. The robot allows much more dexterity, allows me to suture the defect from the tumor much quicker and much easier, and also allows me to reconstruct a, a, a blocked kidney for a pyeloplasty much faster and much easier. When we detect a, a renal mass, the, 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 main, the main treatment is surgical excision. Kidney tumors don't respond to traditional chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So the primary treatment, if the patient's a surgical candidate, is surgical excision, either by removing the entire kidney or just the tumor itself. Uh, if a patient's older and has more comorbidities and has a small renal mass, say less than three centimeters, they may also be uh, treated with surveillance just by monitoring the tumor over time with CT scans or MRIs, or even ablative technologies, which involves freezing or burning the tumor under radiologic guidance. However, the gold standard of treatment is removal of the tumor, either, either by removing the whole kidney or removing just the tumor itself. Since the introduction of the robot, it's made it much easier for us to perform this surgery. So more and more urologists are able to offer patients what I, what I call nephron sparing surgery or partial nephrectomy, where just the tumor is removed, the remaining normal kidney is left behind, and that patient's much better off with having better renal function and still having two kidneys intact, rather than taking the entire kidney out, which was unfortunately more commonplace before the robot. The Firefly fluorescent imaging technology was introduced to robotic surgery in 2011 and we're fortunate enough to have that technology here at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. When I use the Firefly imaging, I mainly use it for partial nephrectomies or removal of a kidney tumor while sparing the rest of the kidney. When I use the Firefly, a tracer is injected into the IV and then I'm able to toggle to a special view on the robotic console which gives me a fluorescent image. The blood supply to the kidney then lights up in somewhat of a black light effect, uh, and I'm able to see the complete blood supply to the kidney. This is important because 25% of patients will have anomalous or extra renal arteries that we just don't see before surgery. If those aren't controlled, then that can lead to more blood loss. So the Firefly lets me see where all of the blood supply to the kidney is and lets me control that and potentially lead to lower blood loss. It also allows me to identify any arteries that may be going directly to the tumor. 
this is good because then I'm able to just cut off the blood supply to that single artery while leaving the blood supply to the rest of the kidney, which is better off for the patient and leads to better renal functional outcomes because then I can just remove the tumor itself uh, and spare the blood supply to the rest of the kidney. Uh, in addition, the Firefly allows me to differentiate or tell the difference between normal kidney tissue as well as tumor tissue. So potentially that can lead to a lower positive margin or a lower risk of leaving any tumor behind because I can really see the outline of the tumor much better with the fluorescent imaging. I think the main benefit for Firefly will be for complex tumors that are in the middle of the kidney, large tumors that have their own blood supply. Uh, these are very, very difficult procedures to perform uh, laparoscopically, robotically, even open, and, and many times these tumors would have to be removed uh, by radical nephrectomy or removing the whole kidney. Recent reports have questioned the utility of PSA. I believe that the data that we have right now is inconclusive or incomplete at best. And in fact, more recent studies have shown that PSA with longer term follow up actually does have a benefit in men uh, as far as mortality goes. The bottom line is we can all agree that PSA isn't the best screening test or it isn't the greatest test that we have, but it's the only test that we have. Yes, we need better markers, but this is the only test that we have to screen for prostate cancer. Since PSA was introduced in the early 1990s, mortality has been greatly reduced from prostate cancer, as well as metastasis, which is painful for patients. That's been greatly reduced since the introduction of PSA. Additionally, there needs to be kind of a, a distinction between overdiagnosis with PSAs and overtreatment. Just because one patient is, is diagnosed with a low-grade prostate cancer does not necessarily mean that they need to have an aggressive treatment. So I still recommend that all patients be screened. Those who are at high risk, who are African American or have a family history, start to be screened at age 40, while, while everyone else gets screened at age 50. I've even started doing some baseline PSAs on patients in their 40s to risk stratify them because there's some data that any patient in their 40s that has an elevated PSA over one is at increased risk for prostate cancer in the future. So I still definitely recommend PSA screening. PSA is not a black and white test, and you really have to look at the trend, you have to look at the patient history. It's not something where it's, oh, it's over four, you need a biopsy. You really have to look at the trend of the test. So looking at it as, as, as a black and white test, and yes, that's not a good marker because it's not a specific marker, but again, it's the only thing that we have. And using it in an intelligent way and making intelligent decisions by making, uh, having an informed discussion with your patient on whether we should get a biopsy or even an informed discussion with your patient on what kind of treatment you need, that's more responsible than say, let's not screen at all. I think number one is that we take a multidisciplinary approach to all of these problems, kidney cancer, prostate cancer, and bladder cancer. We have a very good relationship with our medical oncologists as well as our radiation oncologists, and therefore patients will get a fair assessment. As far as robotic surgery, we have highly trained surgeons that perform robotic surgery. We've done multiple of these procedures over time. We're very comfortable with performing robotic surgery. And studies have shown that going to uh, higher volume centers and going to a more experienced surgeons leads to better outcomes.